pray together. Father, how grateful we are for the privilege that is ours to be in this place of worship. May we not take our gathering for granted, but with hearts filled with praise, God, we will worship you for you and you alone are worthy of our affirmation, our adoration, and our praise. So God, we, we worship you today. And now as we turn our attention toward your word, our prayer, God, is that you would make it come alive, that you will speak to us, that you will challenge us, but ultimately, God, that you will change us, continue to conform us into the image of your dear son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name that we pray and ask you for it all. And the people of God said, amen. amen. Well, good morning. I greet you with Jesus' joy. What a joy and privilege it is to be back with you. Thank you, Pastor John, for uh, the privilege of being back here. I said this morning, it's good to have been invited back to get, uh, to get right this time what I got wrong the last time, but uh, certainly grateful for the privilege to uh, our leader, Thank you, Sister Gloria, thank you so much for the invitation to come. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jonah. We don't, we don't hear much about Jonah these days, especially as it relates to evangelism and missions, but I believe that it's right here in the text. And Pastor has already shared with you, I try to stay close to the text. There's safety in the text. And so it is my custom to stand for the reading of God's word. I know you've already settled in and gotten ready for the nap. But uh, if you would just, uh, if you're at all able, once you arrive at Jonah chapter 3, if you'll join me on your feet as we reverence and respect the reading of the word of the Lord. Jonah chapter 3, hear ye the word of the Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Amen. That's enough. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Look with me again at the first verse. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I want to tag this text by way of thought and title, The Ministry of Another Chance. Is there anybody but me excited for another chance? Those of us who will admit and confess, we've not always gotten our, 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 our first chances correctly, that, that we messed up in the past. Maybe I'm the only one in this place this afternoon, this morning, it's still morning, who's excited about another chance. I've lived long enough, I've been in ministry long enough to just thank God for another chance, another opportunity, another privilege, another privilege to be in his house, another opportunity to worship him. Maybe you get it right the first time, but some of us have to thank him for another chance. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those of you who are not excited, just let you know I'm excited enough for you because I've had so many chances. He's watched over me and kept me so many times that I've learned and lost count. I've just started thanking him for another chance, another opportunity. I read in your hearing Jonah chapter three. The reason this text excites me is because the Bible says in the first verse of the third chapter that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Now, if you know anything about the story, just stay close to the text because this is not the first time that Jonah receives this message. 
In fact, he receives the same message in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. He commands Jonah to go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it. But Jonah responds differently in the third chapter than he responds in the first chapter. Because in the first chapter, the Bible says that after hearing what God had instructed him to do, Jonah decides, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I don't want to go where you want me to go. I know you're calling me to missions, but that's not where I want to do missions. And I wonder how many of us, like Jonah, have begun to pick and choose where and to whom we want to serve. There's a whole lot of Jonah in you and I. We're not much different from this man, Jonah, because Jonah hears from God. Jonah knows what God wants him to do. There's no, there's, no, there's no question. There's no doubt. There's no obscurity. Jonah knows exactly what God wants him to do, where God wants him to go. But in spite of knowing exactly what God wants from him, Jonah decides, I don't want to do that just like I've done in the past, and just like some of us. I want to suggest that there are many of us who have gathered here this morning who, just like Jonah, have, has heard God speak to us, has heard instructions from God, demands from God, commands from God, and expectations from God, and yet in spite of moving in obedience to what God has called and commanded us to be and do, there are many of us who have gathered in this place who have decided like Jonah, I don't want to do that. So the Bible says in the first chapter that after hearing clearly from God, Jonah decides, I don't want to do that. And so because he doesn't want to do that, he flees to Tarshish. The Bible says he pays the fare. He finds a ship on its way to Tarshish in opposition to where God wants him to go. He pays the fare, goes down on the boat. And the Bible says in the third chapter, of the third verse rather, that he He's, he's seeking to flee the presence of the Lord. So here's the picture. Jonah hears from God, but decides to disobey God. Is there areas of your life where you're walking in disobedience to what you know God has said to you? There's a whole lot of Jonah in you and I. So why doesn't Jonah want to go? I'm glad you asked. That's a wonderful question. You know, they asked the same question in the first service. Why, why doesn't Jonah want to go to minister in, in Nineveh? Well, Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrians. The Assyrians had oppressed Jonah and his people for generations, and Jonah developed a hatred for the Assyrians. The Assyrians didn't like him, and he didn't like them. And yet those are the very people that God was sending him to minister to. But because Jonah didn't like them, Jonah decided, I don't want to minister to them. And so what Jonah didn't understand is that his, his hatred for them was greater than his love for God. That whenever you and I make a decision to disobey God, literally what we are saying to God is whatever you're calling us to do, whatever the situation and circumstance is, my decision to disobey really says to you, God, that this is more important to me than you. And so Jonah hated them more than he loved God. Because if it, if, had he loved God more than he hated them, he would have walked in obedience, not because he loved them, but because he loved God. And you and I, we, we live our lives in, a, a, in such a way that we obey that which is important to us. So that's why Jonah didn't like them. Jonah didn't like them because they had oppressed him. Jonah dis, didn't want to minister to them because he didn't like those people. I don't like those people. First Julius, do you have some those people in your life? You know those people. 
those people who live on the other side of the tracks, those people who speak maybe a different language than you, those people who have a different belief system, those people who have different views of sexuality and marriage, don't, you know those people. Those people who are far from God. Maybe y'all don't have some those people. Well, actually, all of us have some those people in, in, in our lives. In fact, I told the first crowd, I got some those people in my own family. <laughs> those people who as long as they're over there, we get along a whole lot better. Some people, it's just a whole lot easier to love from afar. <laughs> those people. Jonah didn't want to minister to those people. I was in the church, I didn't say it earlier, but I was in the church a few months ago and there was a lady who was saying, we don't want those people in our church because those people will change our church. Let those people go to their own church because they, they feel more comfortable in a church, you know, of those people. And I stopped by on my way to heaven to remind us God loves those people. Whoever the those people in your life and all of us, each and every one of us have some those people in our lives. Whoever they are, whatever their demographic is, God loves those people. And because God loves those people, you and I better learn to love those people. In fact, it was those people that Jesus stepped out of eternity and gave his life on the cross of Calvary for. And so when God loved them, he also loved us. We better love those people. But Jonah didn't like those people, and so because he didn't like those people, he didn't want to minister to those people. Why didn't he want to go is the question that we're wrestling with. One, he didn't like them. Secondly, he also understood the character of God. He understands that God is a loving, forgiving, long-suffering, patient God. He knows that if he goes and ministers to them, that God might actually forgive them. And he didn't want God to forgive them. He wanted them to experience the full wrath of God's judgment. Literally. And we see that played out in chapter 4. But, but Jonah did not want God to forgive them because he knew the nature of God, but he also understood the transformational power of the gospel. He understood that it was the gospel that can change and transform a man's life. And if he went and preached the gospel, they might actually believe the gospel. And if they believe the gospel, they might be transformed by the gospel. And if they were transformed by the gospel, God might actually forgive them. And he didn't want God to forgive them. So because he didn't want God to forgive them, he held back the gospel. I told you there's a whole lot of Jonah in you and I because like Jonah, many of us have held back the gospel from those people. We have picked and chosen who we want to minister to, who we want to share the only message of transformation with, which is the gospel. It is the gospel that transforms men's life. Paul wrote it this way in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He said that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that transforms men's life. Not politics, not social services, it is the gospel. So if we want to begin to to see Ulysses and, and Texas and the world transformed, it's only going to be by the gospel. And whenever you and I hold back from sharing the message of the gospel, literally we are putting people in damnation and putting them in danger of one day experiencing the full wrath of God's judgment. So Jonah doesn't want to go. And so the Bible says in the first chapter that he flees God, gets on a ship, pays the fare, seeking to flee the very presence of the Lord. But the Bible says in the fourth verse of the fourth chapter that even while Jonah was fleeing God, God sends a strong wind because he's pursuing Jonah. 
And I know it may not excite you all here, but I, I get excited that I serve a God that even when I have fled him, even when I have walked in disobedience to him, he still pursues me with an everlasting love. I, I know that don't excite y'all here, but that excites me that I serve a God who even in the midst of my disobedience loved me beyond my faults. God, that excites me. And so the Bible says in the fourth verse that God sends a strong wind and, he, and, and while Jonah is on the ship fleeing God, God is pursuing him. And then Jonah begins to reap the consequences for his decision to disobey God. And I stop by as a reminder just to say to us that whenever we make a decision to disobey God, there are always consequences for disobeying. That no matter who you are, no matter what your role is, there are consequences for disobeying God. Three things that sin will always do. Sin will always cost you more than you had planned on paying. Sin will always take you further than you initially planned on going. And sin will always keep you longer than you initially intended to stay. Sin will always do those things. And whenever we make a decision, you and I make a decision to disobey God, there are consequences. We see it played out in the life of this man, Jonah, in the first chapter, that throughout the first chapter, we see Jonah hearing from God, deciding to disobey God. And the rest of the chapter, of the first chapter, we see Jonah reaping the consequences for his disobedience. My friends, there are, there are consequences for disobeying God. And by the end of the first chapter, we see Jonah being thrown overboard. The Bible says in the 17th verse of the first chapter that God creates a great fish to swallow Jonah. And I used to think that the fish was punishment. But when you read the text more carefully, you see that the, role, that the fish was not punishment. The fish was actually protection. That even though Jonah was fleeing from God, God created this environment to protect Jonah because even though Jonah was disobeying God, God still wants to use him. And let me just put a dime in the meter and park there for a moment and say, even though you've disobeyed God in the past, the fact that you still have breath in your body and life in your body, God still wants to use you. God loves you. God has a plan and purpose, yes, even for you. Uh, that don't excite y'all. That, that, that excites me, that God loves me, that God still wants to use me. And it doesn't matter how bad I've messed up, how many times I've messed up. In fact, I've messed up so many times, I've learned to just thank him for another chance. Ah. And so at the end of the first chapter, we see Jonah being thrown overboard, God creating a great fish to swallow him. And in the entire second chapter of Jonah's story, we see God dealing with his servant, Jonah, in a negative environment. Here's what I've discovered, that sometimes God has to allow negative environments because he can get our attention in the negative environment when he can never get our attention when everything seems to be going all right. It's just something about the valley experience that God can speak to us and get our attention that he can't get our attention when we're on the mountaintops of life. I don't know about you, but when I'm on the mountain peaks of life, I don't pray as hard. I don't study as diligently. I don't draw near to God like I do in the valley. It's just something about valley experiences that pulls me closer to God. It's, it's something about the negative environments that, that, that God can get our attention when he can't get our attention, when everything is, is going all right. Sometimes we experience the hardships of life, not because God doesn't love us, not because God has, has given up on us, but sometimes God has to allow us to be on our sick bed. Sometimes God has to put us flat on our back. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom because God can get our attention in those environments that he could never get our attention when everything seems to be going all right. And so in the second chapter, we see Jonah in the belly of this great fish at the bottom of the sea, and it's in that environment that he can get God's attention. Now, I said all of that to get us to our text. 
Because the Bible says as you draw to the end of the second chapter that Jonah finally decides, I guess you're God and I'm not and I should obey what you want me to do. And when he gets to that point, the Bible says at the end of the second chapter that God speaks to the fish and commands the fish to spit him up. And even the fish obeys God. Vomits Jonah up on, on dry land after three days and three nights. Then, that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Says to him, Jonah, go down to Nineveh, that great city. Preach to it the message that I give you. The Bible says, and Jonah went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Wait a minute, put a dime in the meter. Wait, something happened. Push, rewind, and play. Look at the text. God hadn't changed. God's message never changed. In the first chapter, he said the same thing to the same servant, but something happens differently in the third chapter. The same God speaks the same message that the same God spoke in chapter 1. What happened between chapter 3 and chapter 1? I'm glad you asked. Chapter 2. <laughs> it was the negative environment that got Jonah's attention. It was the negative environment that got Jonah to change how he responded to the word of God. Can I ask you a question? Is God going to have to do a chapter 2 in you before you will put your yes on the table and walk in obedience to God? But there's something about that chapter 2 that when he hears the word of the Lord the second time, he responds differently than he did when he heard it the first time. 21 years of marriage, I know that's nothing to some of y'all, but 21 years of marriage, I was with a group of young adults last week and they say, how in the world does somebody stay married 21 years? I say, well, it's called the ministry of stick to itness. You just make up your mind, you're going to stick to it. And I said, you learned some lessons. They said, well, what are the lessons you learned? What would you share with us? I said, well, these are some of the lessons I learned. The main lesson is simply this. There's some stuff I fought about in year one that I don't fight about in year 21. <laughs> you just learn through, through negative situations, negative environments, that even when you win the fight, right, John, you don't really win the fight. Somebody will get that on the way home. Say, oh, that's what he meant. Okay, I get it. I, I get it now. I get it now. You never, men, you never really win. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jonah the second time. And the Bible says after hearing the word of the Lord the second time, he goes to Nineveh. He preaches the word to them. And the fourth verse of the third chapter says, or the fifth verse says, he preaches and the people believe. You missed it. Press rewind. Play. Jonah goes, preaches the word of God to them. The people believe and repent. You're missing it. I, I, I see the clapping, but you're missing it. Look at the, look at the order. Jonah, the servant of Lord, goes and obeys God and preaches the word of God and the people hear the word of God and they believe and repent. God. You've been trying to figure out how to reach the country. You've been trying to reach how to reach your city. You've been trying to figure out how we're going to reach and transform the world. Here it is. It only happens when the people of God, you and I, take serious the commands of God and walk in obedience to God and engage people who are far from God that they might know the hope we have in God that they might turn to God. That's the remedy. It starts with you and I taking serious. It started with Jonah taking serious the commands of God and walking in obedience to God. And he engaged people who were far from God. He preached the word of God to them and shared with them the hope he had in God that they might turn to God. 
And in the third chapter, in the fifth verse, the Bible says the people hear the word of God, they believe the word of God, and they repent and they fast. Jonah's worst fear has happened. Because remember, he didn't like those people. He wanted those people to experience the full wrath of God's judgment. The reason he didn't want to go was he understood the transformational power of the gospel. And if he preached to them, they might actually believe and repent and then God would be obligated to save them. Maybe he could look forward in his future glass and he could read the words of Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation that it is the gospel that transforms men's life it is the gospel that snatches people out of hell and gives them an eternal future it's the gospel maybe in his future futuristic eyesight he could see as the spirit plants on his heart that God would declare through Paul in Romans chapter 10 verse 13 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved 14th verse but how shall they call on him of whom they've not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard and how shall they hear unless somebody will tell them that is our responsibility we are the declarers of the word of God we are the bearers of light we are the bearers of the gospel and whenever we don't share the gospel we put people in hell's danger but Jonah goes Jonah preaches the people believe and repent and the fifth verse of the third chapter says not only did they believe but they fasted Sixth verse says, not only did the people believe, but the king also believed. Covered his head with ashes and passed an edict throughout the land that the name of the Lord shall be heralded in this place. Tenth verse of the third chapter says that God saw that the people believed and repented and he relented. He held back back from them the devastation that he was going to pour out on them. Is that what your Bible says? Your Bible tells you that when God saw how the people responded, he held back from them the devastation and destruction that he was going to pour out on them. And for many years we've heard I've heard this story of Jonah, Sunday school, VBS, Awana, our, our sermons, I've heard this story about this man, Jonah. And here's what I always heard about Jonah. Here was a man who heard from God. Here is a man who decided to disobey God. Here is a man who reaped the consequences of his disobedience because he found himself on a ship then in the belly of a fish that he stayed for four days, for three days, three days, three nights. And after three days, three nights, the fish vomited him up on dry land. That's all I ever heard of this man, Jonah. But when you read a little bit closer, you find out a little bit more about Jonah. Here's what I never heard about Jonah. Here was a man who had a significant, impactful ministry. I never heard that about Jonah. But it's right here in the text. God gives us insight in chapter 4, verse 11. Because after Jonah experiences this great ministry revival in chapter 3, you would think he'd be happy, but he was really upset. Because remember, he hated those people. And while God is dealing with Jonah, in the 11th verse, he gives us an insight and a descriptive of this great city, Nineveh. In fact, your Bible tells you that 
God says that of Nineveh, this exceedingly great city, it was a city of 120,000 people. Here's the picture that because Jonah went, because Jonah preached, because Jonah declared what God said to him, 120,000 people were saved. God. You. I don't know a preacher alive where well, Jonah's not alive, but I don't know a preacher today. I've never met a preacher who would not be excited about 120,000 people giving their life to the Lord and being saved. You'd be, pretty, you'd be pretty excited about 120,000 people giving their lives to the Lord. So the picture is that because of Jonah's ministry, 120,000 people were saved. But we never hear about that. All we ever hear about Jonah is here's a man who heard from God. Here's a man who disobeyed God. Here's a man who reaped the consequences of his disobedience, ended up in a fish that spit him up on dry land. That's all we ever hear about Jonah. Because as significant and as impactful as his ministry was, it's always overshadowed by his disobedience. And sometimes we can't see his ministry because his disobedience covers it up. Here's the point. Is your yes on the table? All God wanted from Jonah is really all he wants from us. All he wanted was Jonah's yes. All he wants from you is your yes. Your unconditional yes. Your yes that says to whoever, wherever, whenever, However, that before I even know the question, the answer is yes. And until we get to that place, individually and collectively, we might do some great things, have impactful ministries, but until we get to that place, it'll always be overshadowed by our disobedience because all God ever wants from us is our yes and so I stopped by on my way to heaven to ask a question it's a question that walks down every aisle looks each of us in the eye of our spirit it demands an answer is your yes on the table All he ever wants is our yes. When I grew up, we used to sing a song in the church that said, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Is your yes on the table? Or are you like Jonah, deciding to whom and to where you want to go? Because sometimes it's easier for us to go overseas, and sometimes it's a lot harder for us to go across the street or across the room. But the same message of transformation that can happen in faraway lands is the same desire that God has in your Jerusalem. That we've all been called to be missionaries. We're more than just members. If you're saved, you are a missionary. You are on mission with God. God invites you to be on mission with him. The question is, 
Will you respond like Jonah in chapter one? Or will you respond like Jonah in chapter three? The only difference between chapter one and chapter three is that in chapter three, he said yes. May it be said of us that we are a people of yes. Father, we thank you so much for our time in your word. Maybe there's somebody here who needs to place their faith and trust in you and the greatest decision that they can make is they need to say yes to your will and your way. Maybe there's others here who've had conditional yeses on the table. May this be the day that they put an unconditional yes and say, God, to whomever, to wherever, to however, whenever, for as long as you say, my answer is yes. Amen.